Chapter 19 Pramea Abhideya Tattva After taking his meal, Brajanath retired to bed with various conflicting views about Achintya Beda Beda, the doctrine of inconceivable oneness and difference arising in his heart. Sometimes he thought that Achintya Beda Beda Tattva was just another kind of Mayavad philosophy. But when he reconsidered the teaching seriously, he realized that there was no objection in Shastra to it. On the contrary, it contained the essence of all Shastras. Sriman Gorkishore is the complete manifestation of Bhagavan himself, and his profound teachings cannot possibly be faulty in any way, he said to himself. I will never give up the lotus feet of that extremely kind and affectionate Gorkishore. But alas, what have I attained so far? I have come to understand that Achintya Beda Bay Tattva is the ultimate truth, but what have I gained through this knowledge? Sri Raghunath Das Babaji has said that Priti, love, is the sadhya of life for all jivas. Kamis and Gyanis are also searching for love, but they are ignorant about Shuddha Priti. That is why I must reach the stage of unadulterated love, but my only concern is, how may I achieve it? I will inquire from Babaji Mahashai about this subject and adopt his principles. Thinking like this, Brajanath fell asleep. Since Brajanath went to sleep quite late, he also awoke late the next morning. The sun had already risen when he rose from his bed, and he had hardly finished his morning ablutions when his maternal uncle, Vijay Kumar Bhattacharya Mahashai arrived from Sri Modruma. Brajanath was very pleased to see his uncle after so many days. He offered him Dandavat Pranam and respectfully offered him a seat. Vijay Kumar was a great scholar, an orator of Srimad Bhagavatam, and he would travel considerable distances to give Bhagavatam discourses. By the mercy of Sri Narayan, he had developed staunch faith in his heart in Sri Goranga Mahaprabhu. Some days previously, he had the good fortune of obtaining darshan of Sri Vrindavan Das Thakur in a village by the name of Denuda. Sri Vrindavan Das Thakur had ordered him to visit the inconceivable Yogapith at Sridham Mayapur, where Sri Sachinandan Gorahari's Achintya Lila eternally takes place. He also informed him that soon most of the holy places of Sriman Mahaprabhu's pastimes would soon disappear and would reappear after four hundred years. He said that the places of Sri Gora's pastimes were essentially non-different from Sri Vrindavan, the holy place of Krishna's Leela, and that only those who can perceive the transcendental nature of Sri Mayapur can truly have darshan of Sri Vrindavan. Hearing these words of Sri Vrindavan Das Thakur, the incarnation of Sri Vyasadev, Vijay Kumar became very eager to take darshan of Sri Dham Mayapur, and decided to go there after visiting his sister and nephew in Bilva Pushkarini. These days, the villages of Bilva Pushkarini and Brahma Pushkarini are somewhat distant from each other, but in those days they were immediately adjacent, and the boundary of Bilva Pushkarini was within a mile of Sri Dham Mayapur Yogapit. The old village of Bilva Pushkarini is abandoned these days and is known by the name of Tota or Taran Vasha. When uncle and nephew had exchanged pleasantries, Vijay Kumar said, Tell grandmother that I am going to take darshan of Sridhar Mayapur, and that I will be back soon and take my afternoon meal here. Uncle, why do you want to visit Mayapur? asked Brajanath. Vijay Kumar was at that time unaware of Brajanath's present condition. He had only heard that Brajanath had given up his study of Nyaya Shastra, and was now studying Vedanta Sutra, so he did not consider it appropriate to describe his devotional sentiments to him. Instead, he hid his real motive and said, I have to meet someone in Mayapur. Brajanath was aware that his uncle was not only a great scholar of Srimad Bhagavatam, but also a devotee of Sri Gora, so he guessed that he must have some spiritual purpose in visiting Sri Dham Mayapur. Uncle, he said, a very faithful and elevated Vaishnava called Sri Raghunath Das Babaji resides in Mayapur. You must have some discussion with him. 
Encouraged by Brajanath's words, Vijay Kumar said, Are you developing faith in the Vaishnavas these days? I heard that you had given up the study of Nyaya Shastra and were studying Vedanta, but now I see that you are entering into the path of Bhakti, so I need not hide anything from you. The fact is that Sri Vrindavan Das Thakur Mahashai has ordered me to have darshan of Sri Yogapit at Sri Mayapur, so I have decided to take bath in the waters of Sri Gangadevi and then circumambulate and take darshan of Sri Yogapit. Then at Sri Vasangan, I shall roll to my heart's content in the dust of the Vaishnava's lotus feet. Brajanath said, Uncle, please take me along with you. Let's meet with mother and then leave for Mayapur. Deciding thus, they informed Brajanath's mother and left for Mayapur. First they took bath in the Ganga, and Vijay Kumar exclaimed, Ah, today my life has become successful. At this ghat, Sri Sachinandan Gaurahari bestowed unlimited mercy upon Janavi Devi by performing his water pastimes here for twenty-four years. While bathing in these sacred waters today, I am feeling Paramananda. When Brajanath heard Vijay Kumar speak these words in an inspired mood, he spoke with a melted heart, Uncle, today I am also blessed by your mercy. After Ganga Snan, they visited Mahaprabhu's birthplace at the home of Jagannath Mishra. There, by the mercy of Sri Dham, they became completely immersed in a mood of deep spiritual love, and their bodies became drenched with tears. Vijay Kumar said, If one takes birth in this land of Gora, but does not visit this Maha Yogapit, one's life is useless. Just see how this holy place seems to material eyes to appear as an ordinary piece of land, covered by straw huts. But by Goranga's mercy, see what beauty and opulence is visible to us. Look, how high and splendid are these bejeweled mansions! How inviting are these lovely gardens! How attractive to the eyes are these places of worship! Look, here Sri Goranga and Vishnu Priya are standing inside the house. Oh, what an enchanting form! What an enchanting form! As he said this, they both fell down and lost consciousness. After quite some time, they recovered with the help of some other devotees and entered Sri Vasangam. Tears flowed from their eyes and they rolled on the ground, exclaiming, Ha Srivas, Ha Advaita, Ha Nityananda, Ha Gadad, Ha Garanga. Please give us your mercy. Free us from false pride and give us the shelter of your lotus feet. All the Vaishnavas there became very joyful when they saw such emotions in the two Brahmanas. They began to dance, chanting loudly, Mayapur Chandra Ki Jai, Ajita Goranga Ki Jai, Sri Nityananda Prabhu Ki Jai. Rajanath immediately offered his body at the lotus feet of his worshipable spiritual master, Sri Raghunath Das Babaji Maharaj. The elderly Babaji picked him up and embraced him, asking, Baba, what brings you here at this time today? And who is this respectable Mahajan with you? Brajanath humbly told him everything, and the Vaishnavas seated them with utmost respect. Vijay Kumar then inquired submissively from Srimad Raghunath Das Babaji Maharaj, Prabhu, by what means can the ultimate aim, Prayojan, for all jivas be achieved? Please be merciful and tell us how we can attain that Prayojan. Babaji, you are Shuddha Bhaktas, and everything is within your grasp. Still, since you have mercifully asked, I will explain whatever little I know. Krishna Bhakti, which is free from any trace of jnana and karma, is the Prayojan, ultimate aim for all jivas, and it is also the means of attainment. During the stage of spiritual practice, sadhana avashta, it is called sadhan bhakti, and in the liberated stage, siddha avashta, it is called devotional service performed in prema bhakti, pure love. Vijay, what are the intrinsic characteristics, swarup lakshan, of bhakti? Babaji, by the order of Sriman Mahaprabhu, Sri Rupa Goswami has described the intrinsic characteristics of bhakti in Sri Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu 1 1 11 as follows Anya Bilashita Shunyam Jnana Karmadi Anavritam 
Anokulyena Krishna nu Shilanam Bhakti Uttama. Uttam Bhakti, pure devotional service, is the cultivation of activities that are meant exclusively for the pleasure of Sri Krishna. In other words, the uninterrupted flow of service to Sri Krishna, performed through all endeavors of body, mind, and speech, and through expression of various spiritual sentiments, bhavs. It is not covered by jnana, knowledge of nirvishesh brahm, aimed at impersonal liberation, and karma, reward-seeking activity, yoga or austerities, and it is completely free from all desires other than the aspiration to bring happiness to Sri Krishna. This sutra very clearly describes both the Swarup Lakshan, intrinsic characteristic, and the Tatashta Lakshan, extrinsic symptoms of bhakti. The word Uttama Bhakti refers to pure devotional service. Devotional service mixed with fruit of activity, Karma Mishra Bhakti, and devotional service mixed with speculative knowledge, Gyan Mishra Bhakti, are not pure devotional service. The aim of devotional service mixed with fruit of activity, Karma Mishra Bhakti, is sense gratification, and the aim of devotional service mixed with speculative knowledge, Gyan Mishra Bhakti, is liberation. Only such devotional service, free from any trace of desire for fruitive results or liberation, is Uttama Bhakti, pure devotional service. The fruit of bhakti is prem. The Swarup Lakshan of bhakti is endeavors favorable for Krishna, Krishna Anu Shilanam, performed with body, mind and speech, and loving attitude of mind, Priti Maya Manasa. Such endeavors, chesta, and spiritual sentiments, bhavs, are both favorable, anukulya, and constantly dynamic. By the mercy of Krishna and his bhaktas, when the special function of the internal energy of Bhagavan manifests upon the jiva's own spiritual strength, then the true form, swarup, of bhakti takes birth. In the present state, the jiva's body, mind and speech are all materially afflicted. When the jiva directs them by his own discrimination, the result is only dry speculation and renunciation, and the true nature of bhakti does not manifest through them. However, when Krishna's Swarup Shakti becomes active in the jiva's body, mind and speech, the nature of pure bhakti immediately becomes manifest. The ultimate aim of all spiritual activities is Sri Krishna, and that is why real devotional activity must be favorable towards Krishna. Endeavors performed for realization of Brahman and Paramatma are not accepted as pure bhakti. Rather, they are aspects of speculative knowledge, jnana, and fruit of activities, karma, respectively. There are two types of endeavors, those that are favorable and those that are unfavorable. Only favorable activities are considered to be devotional service. The word anokulyena means the tendency to be favorably disposed towards Krishna. This tendency has some connection with the material world during the period of devotional practice, sadhana kala. But in the liberated stage, siddha kala, it is utterly pure, free from any connection with the material world. The characteristics of bhakti are the same in both these stages. Therefore, the intrinsic characteristics of bhakti are endeavors for the cultivation of Krishna consciousness performed with favorable sentiments. While we are discussing the intrinsic characteristics, Swarup Lakshan of Bhakti, it is also necessary to describe the extrinsic characteristics, Tatasta Lakshan. Srila Rupa Goswami has explained that there are two Tatasta Lakshan. The first is having no other desires, and the second is freedom from the covering of Gyan, Karma, and other such endeavors. Any ambition, other than the desire for progress in bhakti, goes against bhakti and comes in the category of other desires. Jnana, karma, yoga and renunciation are said to be antagonistic to bhakti when they are strong enough to cover the heart. Therefore, pure bhakti may be described as cultivation of activities that are favorably disposed to Sri Krishna, 
free from both the above antagonistic characteristics. Vijay, what are the various distinctive characteristics of Bhakti? Babaji, in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu 1.117, Srila Rupa Goswami has described the following six special characteristics of Bhakti. Klesh Agni Shubhada Moksha, Laguta Krit Sudurlaba, Sandra Ananda Visheshatma, Shri Krishna Karsanik Chasa. 1. Klesh Agni. She destroys all kinds of distress. 2. Shubhada. She awards all kinds of good fortune. 3. Moksha Luguta Krit. She makes Krit, the pleasure of impersonal liberation, appear Laguta, insignificant. 4. Sudurlaba. She is rarely achieved. 5. Sandrananda Visheshatma. Her nature is imbued with the most intense and superlative pleasure. 6. Sri Krishna Akasini. She is the sole means to attract Sri Krishna. Vijay. How does Bhakti destroy distress? Babaji. There are three kinds of klesh, distress. Sin itself, pap. Sin in its seed form, papa bij and ignorance, avidya. Sinful activity is classified as pataka, sinful, mahapataka, very sinful, and atipataka, extremely sinful. All these are considered pap. People in whose hearts Shuddha Bhakti has manifested are naturally not inclined to become involved in sinful activities, pap. The desire to commit sins, which is called papa bij, cannot remain in a heart filled with bhakti. Avidya means ignorance of one's spiritual identity. When Shuddha Bhakti first dawns within the heart, the jiva understands very clearly, I am a servant of Krishna, and ignorance disappears altogether. This means that as Bhakti Devi, the goddess of bhakti, spreads her effulgence, the darkness of pap, papa bij, and avidya are expelled from one's heart. On the auspicious arrival of bhakti, all sorts of distress go far away. That is why bhakti is kleshagni. Vijay. How is bhakti shubhada? Babaji. In this world, all types of affection, all good qualities, and all different types of pleasures are considered shubha, auspicious. One in whose heart pure bhakti has manifested is endowed with four qualities, humility, compassion, freedom from pride, and giving honor to others. For this reason, the whole world bestows affection upon him. All kinds of sad gunas are automatically manifest in Shuddha Bhaktas. Bhakti is capable of giving all kinds of pleasure. If one desires, she can give material enjoyment, the happiness of merging into the impersonal Brahman, Nirvishesh Brahmshuka all kinds of mystical powers, cities, sense gratification and liberation. Vijay, how does bhakti make even the pleasure of impersonal liberation seem insignificant? Moksha Laguta Krit Babaji, if even a little love for the Supreme, Bhagavat Rati, has manifested in one's heart, dharma, religion, arta, economic development, Calm, sense gratification, and moksha, liberation, naturally appear insignificant. Vijay, and why is it said that bhakti is rarely achieved, sudurlaba? Babaji, this matter should be understood carefully. Bhakti will remain elusive so long as one performs devotional service improperly, even if one engages in millions of different spiritual practices, sadhan. Apart from that, Bhakti Devi satisfies the majority of people with only impersonal liberation. She does not give bhakti unless she sees that the practitioner is highly qualified. It is for these two reasons that bhakti is rarely achieved. The sadhan of cultivating jnana definitely leads one to liberation in the form of merging into the non-dual Brahman, which is the very form of knowledge. It is also easy to get material sense gratification by performing pious deeds like yagya and other such activities. 
However, if one does not practice bhakti yoga, one cannot achieve bhakti to Sri Hari, even by performing millions of spiritual practices. Vijay, why has bhakti been described as the superlative form of bliss? Sandrananda Visheshatma. Babaji, bhakti is eternal spiritual happiness, and that is why the performance of bhakti places one in an ocean of bliss. If one combines all the different types of worldly material pleasure, adds the pleasure of merging into Brahman, which is the negation of this material world, and multiplies it all tens of millions of times, the resultant pleasure still cannot compare to a single drop of the ocean of the bliss of devotional service. Material pleasures are utterly trivial, and the pleasure that appears by negating material pleasure, mukti, is very dry. But these pleasures are different in nature from the bliss of the spiritual world. One cannot compare two things that are altogether different in character. Therefore, those who have developed some taste for the bliss of performing bhakti find the pleasure of merging into nirvishesh brahm to be insignificant as the water in a cow's hoofprint. Only those who have experienced this pleasure can understand it. Others cannot grasp or discuss it. Vijay, how does bhakti attract the all-attractive Sri Krishna, Sri Krishna Akashini? Babaji, Sri Krishna, together with all his loved ones, becomes forcibly attracted and controlled by a person within whose heart Bhakti Devi has appeared. Krishna cannot be controlled or attracted by any other means. Vijay, if Bhakti is so sublimely potent, why do those who study many Shastras not try to achieve her? Babaji, Bhakti and Sri Krishna are beyond all material boundaries, so human intelligence cannot reach them because it is gross and limited. However, one can easily understand the essence of devotional service, Bhakti Tattva, if he has developed even a slight taste by the influence of pious deeds accumulated in the past. No one but the most fortunate jivas can understand Bhakti Tattva. Vijay, why does material logic carry no weight? Babaji, logic does not have the qualities necessary for understanding spiritual pleasures. It is said, Katha Upanishad 129, Naishatarkena matya apaneya, proktanye naiva sugyanaya preshta. My dearest Nachiketa, it is not proper to use argument to destroy the wisdom of the absolute truth that you have received. Then it is also said, Tarka Pratishtanat, Vedanta Sutra 2111. Logic is useless for establishing any vastu, real substance, because what one person establishes by logic and argument today, a more expert logician will refute tomorrow. That is why it is said, that logic carries no respect. All these statements of the Vedanta establish that logic cannot explain spiritual matters. Brajanath, is there any stage of bhakti between sadhan bhakti and prema bhakti? Babaji, yes, certainly. There are three stages of development of bhakti, sadhan bhakti, bhav bhakti, and prema bhakti. Brajanath, what are the characteristics of sadhana bhakti? Babaji, bhakti is one. The differences are between the different stages of development. As long as bhakti is performed by the conditioned jiva, by means of his senses, it is called sadhana bhakti. Brajanath, you have explained that prema bhakti is an eternally perfect mood, nitya siddha bhav. So why is it necessary to practice in order to attain a sentiment that is eternally perfect. Babaji, Nitya Siddha Bhav is not actually something to be gained from elsewhere. That is, it cannot be produced by sadhana. Sadhana is a name given to the practice of manifesting Bhav in the heart. As long as it is not manifested in the heart, due to being covered, one will have to perform sadhana. In reality, this Bhav is Nitya Siddha, eternally present in the heart. Footnote Kriti sadhya bhavet sadhya bhava sa sadhanabhida 
nitya siddhasya bhavasya prakatyam hridi sadyata bhakti rasamrita sindhu purva lahiri 2 2 sadhana bhakti or the regulative discharge of devotional service is the practice performed with the present senses by which bhav transcendental loving service for krishna is attained this bhav exists eternally within the heart of every jiva and it is the potentiality of sadhana bhakti to awaken it shravanadi kriyatara swarup lakshana tatashta lakshane upa jaya premadan nitya siddha krishna prem sadya kabunai shravanadi shuddha chite kareye udai Chaitanya Charitamrita Madhya Lila 22.106-107 The intrinsic characteristics of bhajan are the spiritual activities of hearing, chanting, remembering and so on. Its marginal characteristic is that it awakens Krishna Prem. Krishna Prem is eternally established in the hearts of all jivas. It is not something to be gained from another source. This love naturally awakens when the heart is purified by hearing and chanting. End of footnote. Brajanath, will you please explain this principle more elaborately? Babaji, certainly Prema Bhakti is Nitya Siddha, eternally perfect, because it is a manifestation of Bhagavan's internal Shakti, but it is not evident in the heart of the conditioned Jiva. Spiritual practice, sadhan, consists of the efforts of body, mind and speech to make it appear in the heart. As long as bhav is not actually attained during the period of sadhana, it is considered a sentiment that is achieved by practice. But its eternal perfection becomes evident as soon as it manifests itself in the heart. Brajanath, what is the distinguishing characteristic feature of sadhana? Babaji, sadhana bhakti is any method that trains the mind to become Krishna conscious. Rajanath, how many kinds of sadhana bhakti are there? Babaji, there are two kinds, Vaidhi and Raganuga. Rajanath, what is Vaidhi bhakti? Babaji, the jiva's spiritual propensity is manifested in two ways. The regulations found in the codes of Shastra are called Vidhi, and the inclination that has its origin in this vidhi is called vaidhi pravritti, the tendency to follow shastra, and bhakti that is caused by the discipline of shastra is called vaidhi bhakti, because it has its origin in vaidhi pravritti. Rajanath, I will inquire about the characteristics of spontaneous attraction, rag, a little later. Now will you kindly describe the characteristics of vidhi? Babaji, the Shastras have prescribed regulative duties called Vidhi and have prohibited certain forbidden activities, Nisheda. The prescribed duties, Vaida Dharma, of the Jivas is to follow all the regulations and to avoid all the prohibited activities. Rajanath, from your explanation, it seems as if Vaida Dharma consists of the rules and regulations of all the Shastras, but the jivas of Kali Yuga are weak and short-lived, so they cannot study the prescriptions and prohibitions of all the Shastras and then ascertain Vaida Dharma. Do the Shastras indicate how we can determine Vidhi Nisheda briefly and practically? Babaji, it is written in the Padma Purana 42.103 and Narad Pancharatra 4.223 Vishmartavyo na jatuchit, sarve vidi nisheda syur, ete yor eva kinkaraha. Always remember Vishnu and never forget him. All the other prohibitions and recommendations are servitors of these two instructions. The purport is that the arrangement of all the various kinds of vidi and nisheda within the shastras are based on these two basic sentences. Duty, vidi, is ascertained to be that which makes one constantly remember Bhagavan, and forbidden activities, nisheda, are those that make one forget him. Remember Bhagavan Sri Vishnu constantly throughout your life. 
This is the basic prescription, vidi, and the arrangement of varnashram and so on for the maintenance of the jivas are subject to it. Never forget Krishna. This, nisheda, is the basic prohibition. Everything else, such as abandoning sinful activities, avoiding the tendency to divert one's attention from Krishna, and atoning for sinful activities, are all subordinate to this basic vidi nisheda. Therefore, all the rules and prohibitions described in the Shastras are eternal servants of the rule to remember Krishna constantly, and the prohibition is to never forget Him. It follows that the regulation to remember Krishna is the fundamental principle amongst all the regulations of Varnashram and other such institutions. Shri Chamasa Uvacha Mukha Bahuru Padebhya Purushasya Shramaisaha Chatvaro Jagyare Varna Guner Vipra Dayapratak Ya E Shang Purushang Sakshad Atma Prabhavam Ishwaram Na Bajantya Vajananti Stanad Brasta Patantyadaha Shrimad Bhagavatam 11.5.2-3 Sri Chamasa said, The Brahmanas came into existence from the mouth of the primordial Sri Vishnu, the Chatriyas from his arms, the Vaishyas from his thighs, and the Shudras from his feet. These four Varnas were born along with their particular characteristics, as were the four specific ashrams. A person living amongst these varnas and ashrams becomes intoxicated by his high social position, varna, and spiritual position, ashram, and fails to worship his Ishtade, Bhagavan, Sri Vishnu, or even disrespects him. Such a person falls down from his position in the system of varna and ashram, loses all his prestige, and takes birth in the lower species. Brajanath why doesn't everyone who follows the regulations of Varnashram practice Krishna Bhakti? Babaji Srila Rupa Goswami explains that amongst all those who follow the regulations of Shastra, only those who develop faith in Bhakti are eligible to engage in Bhakti. They are not attracted towards the regulations of material life, nor do they renounce material life. Rather, they follow the ways of ordinary civilized life to maintain their livelihood and at the same time practice the sadhan of Shuddha Bhakti with faith. A civilized jiva becomes qualified to engage in bhakti as a result of sukriti accumulated in the course of many lives. There are three types of such faithful people, the Kanishta, neophyte, the Madhyam, intermediate bhakta, and the Uttam, highly exalted bhakta. Brajanath, it is said in the Bhagavad Gita that four kinds of people perform bhakti. Artha, those who are distressed. Jignashu, the inquisitive. Atarti, those who desire wealth. And Jnanis, those who are searching for knowledge of the Absolute. What kind of bhakti are they qualified for? Babaji, when they associate with saintly sadhus, their distress, their inquisitiveness, their desire for wealth and their desire for knowledge are removed, and they develop faith in unalloyed devotional service. Then they immediately become qualified for engaging in bhakti. The prominent examples of this are Gajendra, Sonika and the other rishis in Naimisharanya, Dhruva and the four Kumaras respectively. Brajanath, do devotees attain liberation at all? Babaji, there are five kinds of liberation. Salokya, to live on the same planet as Bhagavan. Sharsti, to have the same opulences as Bhagavan. Samipya, to have constant association with Bhagavan. Sarupya, to obtain bodily features similar to Bhagavan's. And Sayuja, to become one with Bhagavan. Bhaktas of Sri Krishna do not accept Sayuja Mukti at any cost because it is blatantly opposed to the principles of bhakti. Salokya, Sharsti, Samipya and Sarupya are not fully opposed to bhakti, but they still retain some adverse elements. The bhaktas of Krishna also completely reject these four kinds of liberation that are manifested in Sri Narayan's abode. In some circumstances, 
these forms of liberation provide comforts and opulences, whereas in their matured stages they guide one towards prema bhakti. If their ultimate result is only comfort and opulence, bhakta should simply reject them. What to speak of liberation? Even Narayan's prasad does not appeal to the unalloyed bhaktas of Sri Krishna. Sri Narayan and Sri Krishna have the same fundamental form and nature, Swarup, from the point of view of Siddhanta, but from the viewpoint of Rasa, Sri Krishna's super-excellent glory is an eternal fact. Brajanath, is it only those who are born in Aryan families who are eligible to engage in bhakti? Babaji, the entire human race is qualified to attain eligibility for bhakti. Brajanath, in that case, it seems that people who are situated in Vanashram have to follow two sets of duties, the regulations of Vanashram and the rules of Shuddha Bhakti, whereas those situated outside Vanashram have only one duty, which is to follow the limbs, angas of Bhakti. This means that people situated in Vanashram have to endeavor more because they have to follow both the material regulations and the spiritual regulations. Why is this? Babaji, a bhakta who is qualified for Shuddha Bhakti may be situated in Vanashram, but his only duty is to follow the Anga of Bhakti, and then all his worldly duties are fulfilled automatically. There is no fault in neglecting worldly duties where they are independent of Bhakti or opposed to it. A qualified bhakta is by his very nature not inclined to neglect prescribed duties or to perform forbidden activities. If in spite of this he accidentally commits some sinful activity, he does not have to perform the penances that are prescribed in the rules governing karma. When bhakti resides in the heart, sins that the bhakta commits by chance do not create a lasting impression, and they are destroyed very easily and quickly. That is why bhaktas do not need to perform any separate penance. Brajanath, how can a qualified bhakta repay his debts to the devatas and others? Babaji, it is said in Srimad Bhagavatam that those who are under the shelter of Bhagavan are not indebted to anyone. Devarshi Bhutapta Dhrinam Pritrinam Na Kinkaro Nayam Rini Charajan Saravatmanaya Sharanam Sharanyam Gato Mukundam Parihritya Kartam Shrimad Bhagavatam 11.5.41 One who completely surrenders to Bhagavan Mukunda, the affectionate protector of the surrendered souls, no longer remains indebted to the devatas, forefathers, other living beings, kinsmen or guests. He is not subordinate to anyone, and he is not obliged to serve anyone. The purport of the final instruction of Bhagavad Gita, 1866, is that Sri Krishna releases one from all sins if he gives up all sorts of duties and comes to his shelter. The essence of the Gita is that when a person becomes qualified for unalloyed bhakti, he is no longer obliged to follow the regulations of Jnana Shastra and Karma Shastra. On the contrary, he attains all perfection simply by following the path of bhakti. That is why Sri Krishna declares, Name Bhakta Pranashyati. My bhakta is never vanquished. Therefore this promise of Sri Krishna should be held above all. When Vijay Kumar and Brajanath heard these words, they said, We have no further doubts in our hearts concerning bhakti. We have understood that jnana and karma are of little consequence, and that without the mercy of Bhakti Devi, there is no auspiciousness for the jiva. Prabhu, now please be merciful and make our lives successful by telling us about the angas of Shuddha Bhakti. Babaji, Brajanath, you have heard Dash Mula as far as the H sloka. You may relate them to your uncle later. I feel very satisfied to see him. Now listen to the ninth shloka. Shruti Krishna Kyanam Smara Nanati Puja Vidigana Tata Dasyam Sakyam Pari Charanam Apyatma Dadanam Navan Ganye Tanni Havidi Gata Bhaktia Anudinam Bhajan Shraddha Yukta Suvi 
Malaratim Vasalabote. One should perform bhajan of the nine processes of Vaidhi Bhakti, namely hearing, chanting, remembering, offering prayers, worshipping, serving Krishna's lotus feet, acting as Krishna's servant, becoming Krishna's friend, and surrendering oneself fully to Sri Krishna. One who with faith daily practices bhajan in this way certainly achieves pure Krishna rati. Shravanam, Kirtanam, Smaranam, Vandanam, Padasevanam, Archanam, Dasyam, Sakyam, and Atmanivedanam, those who daily practice these nine limbs of Vaidhi Bhakti with faith attain pure love for Sri Krishna. Hearing, Shravana, takes place when the description of Krishna's transcendental holy name, form, quality, and pastimes come in contact with the ears. There are two stages of Shravana. The first stage is hearing descriptions of Krishna's qualities in the association of Shuddha Bhaktas before developing Shraddha. This type of Shravana creates faith so that one develops a keen desire to hear Sri Krishna Nam and his qualities. After one has developed such faith, one hears Krishna's transcendental names and qualities with great eagerness from Sri Guru and the Vaishnavas, and that is the second kind of Shravana. Shravana is one of the limbs of Shuddha Bhakti, and Shravana in the perfected stage is manifested as a result of hearing from Guru and Vaishnavas in the stage of spiritual practice. Shravana is the first Anga of Bhakti. Kirtan takes place when Sri Hari Nam and the descriptions of his form, qualities and pastimes come in contact with the tongue. There are many different varieties of Kirtan, such as discussions of Sri Krishna's pastimes, describing Sri Krishna Nam, reading from Shastra to others, attracting others to Krishna by singing about him, uttering entreaties to invoke his mercy, proclaiming his glories to others, chanting bhajans in praise of the deity, offering prayers and so on. Kirtan has been described as superior to all the other nine angas of bhakti, and this is especially true in Kali Yuga, when kirtan alone can bestow auspiciousness upon everyone. It is stated in all shastras, Dhyayan krite ya jan yagyais, treta yam dwapare richan, yad apnoti tarapnoti, kalo sankirtya keshavam. Padma Purana, Uttara Kanda, 72.25 Whatever is achieved in such a yuga by meditation, in Treta Yuga by the performance of Yajna, and in Dwarpa Yuga by worshipping Krishna's lotus feet, is also obtained in the age of Kali simply by chanting and glorifying Sri Keshava. No other method purifies the heart as effectively as Hari Kirtan. When many devotees perform Kirtan together, it is called Sankirtan. Remembering Krishna's name, form, qualities and pastimes is called Smaranam of which there are five kinds. Smaranam means to contemplate some subject that has previously been heard of or experienced. Dharana means to fix the mind on a particular subject, withdrawing it from other objects. Dhyanam means to meditate on a specific form. When Dhyanam is unbroken like the continuous flow of a stream of precious oil, it is called Dhruvanushmriti, and Samadhi is the state in which one is oblivious to outside reality and only aware of the objects of meditation in one's heart. Shravanam, Kirtanam and Smaranam are the three primary angas of bhakti, for all the other angas are included within them. And of these three angas, Kirtan is the best and most important, because Shravanam and Smaranam can be included within it. According to Srimad Bhagavatam 7.5.23 Shravanam Kirtanam Vishnu, Smaranam Padasevanam, Archanam Vandanam Dasyang, Sakyam Atmanivedanam. Hearing and chanting about Sri Vishnu's transcendental name, form, qualities and so on, remembering them, serving his lotus feet, worshipping him with sixteen types of paraphernalia, offering prayers to him, becoming his servant, adopting a friendly mood towards him, and surrendering everything unto him, in other words, serving him with the body, mind, and words. These nine are accepted as Shuddha Bhakti.
the fourth Anga of Bhakti is performing service, Padaseva or Paricharya. Padaseva must also be performed together with Shravanam, Kirtanam and Smaranam. One should perform Padaseva with a humble attitude, understanding that one is unqualified for the service. It is also essential to realize the object of service as Sat Chit Ananda, the embodiment of eternity, knowledge and bliss. Padaseva includes seeing the face of Sri Krishna's deity form, touching him, circumambulating him, following him and visiting holy places such as Sri Bhagavan's temple, the Ganga, Jagannath Puri, Dwarka, Mathura, Navadweep and so forth. Sri Rupa Goswami has presented these in a very clear and vivid way in his description of the 64 Angas of Bhakti. Service to Sri Tulsi and Shuddha Bhaktas is also included within this Anga. The fifth Anga is worship, Archan. There are many considerations regarding qualification and methods of worship. If one is attracted to the path of Archan, even after being engaged in Shravanam, Kirtana and Smaranam, then one should perform Archana after properly accepting Diksha Mantra from Sri Gurudev. Brajanath, what is the difference between Nam and Mantra? Babaji, Sri Hari's name is the life and soul of Mantra. The Rishis have added words such as Namaha, obeisances to Sri Hari Nam, and disclosed its specific power. Sri Hari Nam by nature has nothing to do with this material world, whereas the jiva, because of various bodily designations provided by Maya, is entrapped by objects consisting of dead matter. Consequently, in order to detach the jiva's mind from sense objects, different principles of archan have been established on the path of regulated devotional service, Mariada Marg. When one chants the Krishna mantra, Siddha Sadhya Susida Ari, are not considered. Footnote Gurudev will give initiation to his disciple after performing the process for purifying him of the four defects of Siddha, Sadhya, Susida and Ari, enemy. One may consult Hari Bhakti Vilas, 1st Vilas, Anucheda 52 through 103 regarding these four defects and their remedial measures. But in chanting the king of all mantras, the Krishna mantra of eighteen letters, Gopal mantra, there is no need to consider these four defects, because the mantra is so powerful that these four defects are very insignificant in comparison. In Trilokya Samohana Tantra, Mahadev has said, Astadasha Kshara Mantram Adikritya Shri Shiven Oktam Na Chatra Satrava Dosho Varneshvadi Vicharana And in Brihad Gotamiya it is stated Siddha Sadhya Susidhari Rupa Natra Vicharana Sarvesham Siddhamantranam Yato Brahmaksharo Manu Every single letter of this mantra is Brahman. End of footnote. Initiation into the exclusive chanting of the Krishna mantra is extremely beneficial for the jiva, for of all the different mantras in the world, the Krishna mantra is the most powerful. A bona fide disciple receives strength from Krishna immediately when a bona fide spiritual master initiates him into this mantra. After initiating, Gurudev educates the inquiring disciple concerning the performance of Archan. Briefly, Archan Marg includes the observance of Sri Krishna's appearance day, fasting in Kartik month, observing Ekadashi, taking bath in the month of Marg, and other such activities. One should also understand that one must certainly worship Krishna's bhaktas as well as Krishna himself on the path of Archan. The sixth Anga of Vaidhi Bhakti is offering prayers and obeisances, Vandanam. This is included as part of Padaseva and Kirtan, but it is still considered a separate Anga of Bhakti. Namaskar itself is also called Vandanam. Ekanga Namaskar and paying obeisances with eight parts of the body touching the ground, Astanga Namaskar, are two types of Namaskar. 
It is considered offensive to offer obeisances with only one hand touching the ground, to offer obeisances when the body is covered with cloth, to offer obeisances behind the deity, to offer prostrated obeisances with one's body pointing directly towards the deity or with the right side towards the deity, and to offer obeisances in the Garba Mandir, deity room. Performing service, Dasyam, is the seventh Anga of Bhakti. I am Krishna's servant. This ego or conception of the self is Dasyam, and Bhajan performed with the sentiment of a servant is the topmost Bhajan. Dasyam includes offering obeisances, reciting prayers, offering all of one's activities, serving, keeping proper conduct, and remembering and obeying orders, Kata Shravanam. The eighth Anga of Bhakti is serving as a friend, Sakyam, which includes the mood of kinship towards Krishna with the endeavors for his well-being. There are two kinds of Sakyam, friendship in Vaidhi Bhakti and friendship in Raganuga Bhakti. But Sri Prahlad's shloka refers to Vaidanga Sakyam. For example, the feeling of Sakyam while serving the deity is Vaida Sakyam. The ninth Anga is known as Atmanivedanam, which means offering the whole self, body, mind and pure Atma to Sri Krishna. The characteristics of Atmanivedanam are exclusive endeavor for Krishna and lack of activity for one's own self-interest. It is also characteristic of Atmanivedanam that one lives to serve the desire of Krishna and keeps one's own desire subordinate to Krishna's desire just as a cow that has been purchased does not care for its own maintenance. Atmanivedanam in Vaidhi Bhakti is described in Srimad Bhagavatam 9, 4, 18 through 20 as follows. Savai mana Krishna padara vindayor vachamsi vaikunta gunarnu varnane karo harirmandira marjana dishu shrutim chakarachuta sat kato daye Ambarish Maharaj engaged his mind in serving the lotus feet of Sri Krishna, his words in describing the qualities of Sri Bhagavan, his hands in cleaning Sri Hari's temple, and his ears in hearing Achuta's blissful pastimes. Mukunda Lingalaya Darshane Drishau, Tadbritya Gatras Prashe Nigra Sangamam, Granam Chatatpada Saroja Sourabe. Srimat Tulasyam Rasanam Tadarpite. He engaged his eyes in seeing the deity of Mukunda, different temples, and the holy places, all his bodily limbs in touching the bodies of Krishna's bhaktas, his nostrils in smelling the divine smell of Tulsi offered to Krishna's lotus feet, and his tongue in tasting the prasad offered to Bhagavan. Padau Hare Chaitra Padanu Sarpane. Shiro Rishikesha Padabi Vandane Kamang Chadasye Natukama Kamyaya Yatotama Shloka Janashraya Rati. His feet were always engaged in walking to Bhagavan's holy places, and he would pay obeisances to Sri Krishna's lotus feet. Ambarish Maharaj would offer garlands, sandal, bog, and other paraphernalia in Bhagavan's service, not with a desire to enjoy himself but to receive the love for Sri Krishna that is present only in his Shuddha Bhaktas. When Vijay Kumar and Brajanath heard Babaji Mahashai's very sweet and blissful instructions, they were overwhelmed with joy and offered obeisances to him, saying, Prabhu, you are directly Bhagavan's personal associate. We are both blessed today by receiving your nectarian instructions. We were wasting our days in the useless pride of caste family and high education. By dint of the wealth of Sukriti accumulated in many previous lifetimes, we have obtained your mercy. Vijay, O most eminent of the Bhagavats, Sri Vrindavan Das Thakur ordered me to visit the yoga pit at Sri Mayapur. By his mercy today, I took darshan of that holy place, and also of a personal associate of Sri Bhagavan. If you will be so kind, I will come again tomorrow evening. When the elderly Babaji heard Sri Vrindavan Das Thakur's name, he immediately offered prostrated Dandavats and said, 
I offer my respectful obeisances again and again to the incarnation of Vyasadeva in Sri Chaitanya's pastimes. Since it had become quite late in the morning, Brajanath and Vijay Kumar then departed for Brajanath's home. Thus ends the nineteenth chapter of Jaiva Dharma entitled Pramaya Abhideya Tattva. <laughs>